Well, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we are living in a very complex world. The complexity which we could not even imagine a couple of decades back, and the complexities which is, which is increasing uh, because of the, not the technological changes that are happening, but because the speed at which the technological changes are happening. So the question we are trying to address in this session is, is this technological disruption which is happening, is it an opportunity or is it a threat? And in, in either case, how do we, how do we handle it? If I, if I look at the KPMG Global CEO Survey Report for 2017, which is the latest, and I can tell you even in 16 and 15, a similar trend was there. The CEOs across the globe are actually looking at disruption uh, to be both opportunity as well as, as, as a threat. And disruption from the business perspective are actually coming from various directions. Whether it is the changing characteristics of the millennials, and I can, I can share my personal uh, perspective on that. The generation gap I saw between me and my parents is probably five times more between me and my son, and I'm sure it is applicable to all of us. So there's absolutely, absolutely different world. There's nothing wrong, but this is the future world we are going to deal with. The, the, it's a new world, it's a completely different world uh, we are going to deal with. So the disruptions are coming from there. The disruption is coming from the geopolitical uncertainty that is rising in the world. And of course, on the top of that, the massive technological changes that are taking place. And these are the top three disruptions which the global CEOs are really worried about. So they are looking at it both as a threat and opportunity. Uh, but these are, the, these are the ones. So let's restrict ourselves to the technological uh, changes that are happening for this session. As, as we talk, you know, these artificial intelligent machines or thinking machines or cognitive technology, whatever name we call them by, they are actually, they, they simulate how humans perceive, learn, reason, or even react, respond, uh, as, as the humans have been doing. And, and coupled with the data analytics and the human context on data, they actually have started doing the task which was so far done by the humans. Right? In this scenario, the option for the, for the organizations, or for that matter, for a country, need to and I would say not need to, but have no option but to embrace the technology, the changing technologies, rather than battling them as a, as a challenge. And, and when I say this, I, I, I can add a philosophical reason to that. You know, to me, uh, changing technologies is like samay, it's like kal chakra. You can't stop it. It will continue to grow. And if, you, if it is continuing to grow, if it is continuing to go in one direction, you can adopt and adapt to live with the Kal Chakra, or you can step aside. And I don't want to use the wrong word for stepping aside in this case. And if I can use a very, very crude example of comparing why technologies has to be embraced irrespective of the result, is I can pick up the agriculture sector. In India, all of us know that uh, half of our workforce is involved in agriculture. But what is the outcome? Outcome is about 15%. I may be off a uh, couple of percentage here and there, and broadly talking about uh, to the point. So if 50% of the population working force is engaged in agriculture, delivering 15% of, of the national output, also look at it from the agriculture, the farmer's perspective. While we can, on one hand, look at, look at it to say that we need to protect the job these farmers have, and therefore do nothing in agriculture, right? On the other side, if you deeply look into the, uh, to, to the various problems we have in agriculture in the country, the farmers actually end up making profits if everything goes right, monsoons and everything goes right. They end up making profit which is equal to 
the labor cost of all the family members who are working on that farm. Right. Now answer the question, do we need to adopt technologies in agriculture or protect those 50% of the job? I think I don't need to talk uh, more than that on that. Now, <clears throat> is it already happening? Is it beginning to happen? Is it going to happen? In, in the morning session, uh, the minister also said there is a little debate, minor debate, as to it has already started or is going to start. But the fact is the direction is clear. Indian companies are already adopting AI technologies at a large scale. They are making investment in creating the tech infrastructure and improving the digital skills of the citizens. And some uh, recent research also talk about addition by AI in the country will be $957 billion by 2035 though. But for a $2.6 trillion economy, adding one trillion, almost one trillion from AI is a huge significant number. So even if I, if I consider 2035 and India to be 10, 12 trillion dollar economy, one trillion dollar economy contributed by AI, which does not exist today. So your eight to 10% of development is coming from AI in next 10 to 15 years. And not only that, this will also enable the other sectors to be more efficient and faster, et cetera, et cetera. So whichever sector you look at it, whether it's manufacturing, whether it's uh, retail, whether even safety norms in railways, working with ISRO, or you talk about uh, healthcare, Manipal hospitals have already working on, you know, using the IBM Watson for the, for the oncology. Uh, I don't think Manipal hospitals have fired any doctor since adoption of uh, IBM Watson, which is a far, far more accurate diagnosis and treatment of, of cancer patient. Now the choice is very clear. You need to adopt the technology, the artificial intelligence, and this IBM Watson is, is almost like 10,000 doctors' knowledge put together in one machine, and therefore far, far more accurate uh, diagnosis and treatment, or is still have a long queues of cancer patient outside Rajiv Gandhi Memorial Hospital or, or Tata Cancer Hospital in Mumbai. The choice is very, very clear. But let's look at the employment, since we are talking about the impact on, 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 on employment. India is going to be a $10 trillion economy. Uh, how many jobs do we require to actually uh, make unemployment to be zero? Uh, improbable to predict what tomorrow's hold, but there are enough data and, and uh, research available nowadays which can show the prediction the trend for next 10 to 15 years. Now, if we simply look at the demographics, uh, about 10 to 12 million kids will be attaining the age of majority and therefore be uh, getting into the workforce. Even if we look at some research like Potival Oswal indicating about 10 million jobs creation till 2030 per annum, or government's own estimate of creating 100 million jobs uh, from 2015 to 2022, which is, you know, if simply divide by seven, it will give you about 14 million kind of jobs per, per annum. Now, my personal opinion, the two factors which have not been considered in these calculations, uh, one is while in future we have considered in this 10 to 12 million people joining uh, the workforce each year, both, both genders the male and female, but existing half of our population is mostly not participating in the workforce. And rightly so, some of them will start entering and that movement is gradually starting, but some of them will also join the workforce and therefore there would be many more people coming for the jobs. And secondly and more importantly, when I talked about agriculture, we don't need 50% of the population in agriculture, we need far less than that. With the adoption of technology, even without adoption of technology, you don't need 50% to be working there. These are the forced labor because you're sitting at home, 
You have nothing else to do. You go to the field with your family and participate, whether you're required or not required on the field, you're there. But if you have to take out this population from, from uh, the agriculture, they would also come into the workforce. So approximately, my own estimate is, we would require actually 20 million plus jobs uh, per annum. Now, that's where the country is torn in the dilemma of uh, protecting jobs or creating more jobs or win the cognitive rates. Uh, I, I always uh, take this cliched uh, example about railways. Uh, in, in maybe it was 80s when there was a huge debate about railway should computerize or not computerize and there was big ruckus about you know, people losing job if, if rail, railways starts computerization. Now, if railways has not done that in this country, while they would have protected some jobs of people who were selling tickets on the counter, who were reconciling manually how many tickets have been sold and how many are available, but I'm not sure if railway would have survived like that. If, if you know, they would have, people would have moved on to maybe a different mode of transportation, uh, things would have been completely different if that computerization did not happen. While railways did not protect as many jobs for those ticket-selling agents, but did it not create many more jobs? I don't have the exact data, but I can tell you the people employed in railways today would be far more uh, than they were in 80s when the decision was taken. So there is no doubt while they would, we don't require those ticket-selling agents, there would be different skills required, but there is no doubt there would be far more jobs available uh, than, than, than we have lost it. And, and as I said, it, it's, not, it's not as that bad a situation, whichever way we look at it. While there would be a set of jobs which will cease to exist in future, there would be a set of jobs which will require different skilling set, but there would be new set of jobs getting created. A research suggests that by 2022, there would be 9% of India's large 600 million labor force will be engaged in jobs which do not exist today. Now, 9% of 600 million is about 5.5 crore. If 5.5 crore jobs will emerge from nowhere in the next four years' time, that will provide, you know, almost like if I go by the government estimate about four years, if I go by my own estimate, three years of job requirement of this country. That's huge. 37% of the job will require completely different uh, skill set. Now, even, you know, it's heartening to read about Gartner's study that uh, 1.8 million jobs will be lost to AI, but 2.3 million jobs will be generated by 2020, just two years from now. So there are more jobs getting created than getting lost because of AI. So, uh, you know, it, it, it's not, I, I don't see the question whether uh, AI will be damaging the jobs. I rather look at the question to say how organizations and country will actually work to make AI as an enabler rather than as a replacement to humans to make them faster, more efficient, more productive. I would only say on this slide only one thing that it, it's time. The time to act is now. As if I read uh, the quote from the Jack Welch, uh, from Jack Welch, the, the former chairman of CEO uh, of, of GE, if the rate of change on the outside exceeds the rate of change the, on the inside, the end is near. Right. Now, as I said, about Kal Chakra earlier, if you can't have seven billion people on earth to say, please stop AI and cognitive, we don't want to move in that direction. And if, if you're not participating in it, somebody else is uh, getting into it, and, and therefore you will be left behind if you don't participate. What is required? So frankly, I don't want to answer the question whether uh, it will hurt the job or not. To my mind, it is inevitable, it is required, whichever sector we pick it up, it is for the humanity. We need to move in this direction. We have no option but to move in this direction. The question we need to answer 
is how do we tackle it? Does it have its own challenges? Does it require a few things to be done? Of course, and in a country like India, where the lit illiteracy rate is pretty high, half of your population is living in the rural areas, lot more need to be done. The biggest thing I would say that need to be done is change in the mindset. And change in the mindset in the organizations, in the government, and, and in the academia. The breeding center for any knowledge, for any intelligence, is your universities and colleges and research institute. If universities, and not only universities, but down at the school level, if we are not able to change what we are teaching our, our students, that will create a bigger problem. Uh, again, a very uh, crude example, comparison, you know, uh, in, in Singapore, one of the teaching in the school is how to stand in a queue. And we never see people jumping queues in Singapore while we have a different approach in life in India. Uh, so people can learn. People can learn at all stages. I'm not saying that it has to start only in a school. People can learn at even uh, senior age. Uh, and I have a number of examples, but I will restrict it to one. If you look at the uh, emergence of mobile technology in this country just about 20 years back, I remember uh, people in our generation happily adopted it, gradually over a period of time moved from a simple phone call to SMS, to social media, to you know, WhatsApp, Twitter, uh, net, net banking, mobile banking. We gradually moved and learned and reskilled ourselves. But I remember the generation above me, they were the most difficult one, and when mobile came, the, the, the number of comments I heard from my uncles and my, my parents and everybody else in that generation to say, you know, keep this device away from us. This is for you guys, not for us. Gradually, they were forced to take a mobile phone. Then when they took the mobile phone, they said, okay, I will, it's just because I'm contactable and I will use this phone uh, to make a phone call or receive a phone call. Don't send me any SMS. Gradually, they were forced to get into SMS. And today I don't see anybody in the family or the friends or anybody I interact with who's not using a smartphone and not using a mobile banking on that phone. So at any age people can learn. We have to create that atmosphere, that platform where we can actually reskill people. And skilling and reskilling are the two things or one thing in two forms which has to be handled to make uh, AI actually really successful. Uh, I'm just conscious of time. The world is investing a lot uh, in AI. Uh, India has also taken few baby steps, whether we talk about the doubling of allocation to 3,000 crore plus in this budget uh, on, on the digital India programs or uh, the national program on the new generation technologies by, by Niti Aayog or, you know, policy group or, you know, uh, task force on AI, those baby steps have been taken, uh, but there is a lot more which need to be done. And it cannot happen without private participation, both in terms of adopting the technologies, but also reskilling the existing force which exist in, in, in all these organizations. And of course, uh, there are a number of things which we need to be done. Uh, while I'm repeating it, that it is inevitable to go in that direction. Uh, it's not going to be easy. There are a number of challenges. There are a number of things which we need to deal with. Uh, then, you know, the investment that to be, to be made, the policy framework which need to be done, the research center which have to come up, the support, the skilling in colleges and schools we need to provide, a lot needs to be done. But I'm a diehard optimist. I believe the Indian demographics will lead us to be the leader in this AI. We will not lose jobs. We will create something much bigger. Thank you very much.